Welcome to The Conspiracy Show. My name is Richard Serrett. John Fitzgerald Kennedy, the 35th President of the United States, was assassinated at 12.30 p.m. Central Standard Time on Friday, November 22, 1963, in Daly Plaza, Dallas, Texas. The 10-month investigation of the Warren Commission of 1963-64 concluded that the President was assassinated by Lee Harvey Oswald acting alone and that Jack Ruby acted alone when he killed Oswald before he could stand trial. These conclusions were initially supported by the American public. However, polls conducted from 1966 to 2004 found that as many as 80% of Americans have suspected there was a plot or cover-up. On this episode of The Conspiracy Show, we'll meet several prominent JFK assassination researchers who will present their best evidence for not only a cover-up of the event, but evidence for a conspiracy involving individuals at the highest levels of the U.S. government. We'll also meet a skeptic who says the best evidence supports the lone gunman single bullet theory as laid out in the Warren Commission. Me? I just want the truth. And I'm willing to follow it wherever it leads. It is time to redefine reality. He was far more on the periphery of the uh, conspiracy. Uh, I mean, I don't think he really realized at that point in time that he was being set up to take the fall. The elements of the fakery here, or the framing of the Patsy, are simply overwhelming. Who was Lee Harvey Oswald? He enlisted as a young man into the Marine Corps and underwent recruit training in San Diego and at Edson Range in 1957 58, where I would later serve as a series commander and have 300 recruits and 15 drill instructors under my own command. Lee Oswald was a rather mediocre shot. I mean, during his first year when he was under most intense instruction. He fired 212. That made him a sharpshooter of the three categories, marksman, sharpshooter, and expert. But the next year, in 1958, he didn't qualify at all, which is very odd since there's a standing order that every Marine from the lowest ranking private to the highest ranking general has to qualify with a rifle every year, which suggests that he was on some special assignment. He wasn't trained to use a bolt action rifle. The, weapon that he was alleged to have used uh, was really a very poor caliber weapon. It had a very difficult bolt action, although it was equipped with a telescopic sight. Most Americans don't realize that while that enhances accuracy, it consumes time. So at each time you would work this bolt action, it would throw you off the, off the target and you'd have to reacquire your target. The whole shooting scenario is a farce. Lee Harvey Oswald, who the Warren Commission made essentially the fall guy for the Kennedy assassination, has turned out to be one of the most complex and fascinating 24-year-olds that ever walked the face of the earth. Oswald has all the earmarks of being a kind of intelligence agent who was recruited in the Marine Corps at a relatively young age. His ostensible job was being a radar operator, but he actually ends up being tutored in Russian. By the end of his service, he literally speaks fluent Russian. Why did he become fluent in Russian? Well, he defects to Russia. There was a fake defector program going on at this time. He's obviously sent there, most people would believe, as some what they call a dangle. You know, somebody who would be picked up by the KGB and then become some kind of double agent. But the problem is, the KGB suspected this. Lee Harvey Oswald was a double agent for the United States intelligence agencies. He was sent to Russia to reveal secrets which would allow the U-2 spy plane to be shot down so that right-wing generals in the Pentagon could cancel the summit between Khrushchev and Eisenhower. And again, explain Lee Harvey Oswald's role in scuttling that summit. Lee Harvey Oswald had been trained at Itsugi, Japan, the CIA top intelligence base in radar technology and in the new the U-2 overflight times. 
You see, the U-2 Richard was such a fast plane and flew at such high altitudes that the Russian jets could not get up fast enough in order to catch it. So in order to shoot it down, if they had the times that the plane was going to be passing over, they could in advance get their jets up in the air, scramble them, and shoot it down, which is what they did. In other words, you're saying that that summit may have led to the end of the Cold War. It may have led to the end of the Cold War, certainly would have led to thawing in the relationship. They were trying to build this case to make it appear as if Oswald was a Lenin Marxist and was pro-Cuba so that they could blame the assassination on Castro. In 1962, was paid by the United States government to return. In volume 18 of the Warren Commission, there's what's called the Lee Harvey Oswald repatriation loan. So he is given a loan by the US government. He's brought right down to Dallas, Texas, and safe housed there and protected. He did submit a, an application to repatriate. Um, it was reviewed by a committee. It was accepted by the US Embassy. And he'd expect, too, that there are a couple of other factors, such as him being married, he was a US citizen, and also that he had served in military. This isn't actually something that's completely out of the ordinary. That's the reason why they have these committees to begin with and why they have the application process. Here you have this spectacle of this supposed communist revolutionary coming back to the United States and living in, of all places, with the white Russian community in Dallas. These are the people who want to overthrow Lenin's revolution and bring back the Tsar. In April of 1963, for no discernible reason, he goes to New Orleans. Now, who does he meet up with in New Orleans? Oswald was basically working for uh, Guy Bannister during that period. Oswald started the Fair Play for Cuba Committee. His handlers were using him to infiltrate different subversive organizations. Guy Bannister was deeply involved in the, the whole uh, gun runnings to the anti-Castro Cubans. Different people he was involved with were training paramilitary groups, the whole design to overthrow Castro which led to the uh, Bay of Pigs. Now, if you examine the things that Oswald did that summer, I mean, he's the only guy in the whole city who's part of this so-called Fair Play for Cuba committee. No other members, all right? He does things like leaflet on busy streets at the rush hour in a southern city as conservative as New Orleans was at that time. You don't do this in broad daylight with hundreds of people around in a place like New Orleans. Guy Bannister, who was a former FBI man, who was in charge of the uh, New Orleans part of making Oswald appear as if he was pro-Castro. The purpose of the assassination was to raise the anger of Americans to such a degree that they would agree and be in favor of launching an attack on Cuba. And by giving out fair play for Cuba pamphlets, they were trying to build this case to make it appear as if Oswald was a Lenin Marxist and was pro-Cuba so that they could blame the assassination on Castro. Jim Garrison, who's an author, he's a former New Orleans district attorney, has written extensively about this and suggests that because the offices, and particularly the pamphlet that indicates that office, uh, were so close together that there was some sort of linkage between Oswald and Bannister. The side door was the CIA headquarters, and the other uh, address was the Fair Play for Cuba. These um, pieces of evidence were investigated by the Warren Commission. So uh, Sam Newman, who owned the property at the time and had rented to Bannister, um, testified to the committee that he'd never seen Oswald before. None of the other tenants had, had seen Oswald before. There was a Cuban revolutionary group that met on the First Fork Cafe at a bar called, I think, Mercuso's. So Mercuso's may have been a meeting spot. However, Mercuso himself, the owner of the cafe, was also interviewed by the committee and swore never to have seen, uh, seen Oswald before in his life either. By having a smaller war cartridge, you actually get a, a tighter plane of angle. 
a lot less shake in the movement, a lot less uh, recoil. It's not a surprise at all that he was able to accomplish three very quick shots. Mamluk and Karkana, I mean, it was uh, basically a, a piece of junk that, you know, that they claim that uh, we were able to fire allegedly three shots in a matter of a few seconds, which was uh, physically impossible. The man liquor Carcano uh, really was in terrible shape. It hadn't been properly maintained. As I mentioned, it had this very difficult bolt action. And Lee Oswald was never trained in the Marine Corps to use a bolt action weapon. He was never used to fire with a telescopic sight. He was never trained to fire from a tall building. This particular weapon had a rusty uh, firing pin. The weapon in general had the coy practice of blowing the firing pin out in the face of the shooter. Uh, the scope was misaligned, and the professional marksmen were asked to attempt to replicate Lee Oswald's uh, shots, none of which were successful in doing so. So it was a really a bona fide piece of junk. I find the fact that this is sometimes called the humanitarian rifle or, and that it's uh, disparaged for some of its characteristics. Because many of the exact same characteristics that you'd point out in this rifle are very consistent with it being used in exactly this type of scenario. This particular model, for starters, was the standard infantry unit for Italian infantry for half a century, including both world wars. The first shot that you see on the Zapruder film when he was uh, hit in the throat was uh, not possible because there was a what's called a Texas Elm was in the way. So there wasn't a clear shot at that point. One of the characteristics of these Italian rifles is that they have a, a much smaller bore cartridge. By having a smaller bore cartridge, you actually get a, a tighter plane of angle, a lot less shake in the movement, a lot less uh, recoil, a lot less stopping power. It's not a surprise at all that he was able to accomplish three very quick shots. Why would someone intent on killing the president order the weapon used through the mail and then pose for a photograph? Yeah, this is a good point, of course. Uh, why wouldn't he just go into a local store and buy it and pay cash so that it's not traceable? Well, the, the answer is obvious. Uh, the people who were behind the assassination wanted to set Oswald up as a patsy, and so in order to do that, they ordered it through the mail so that it could be traced. If you examine the transaction, the Warren Commission says it was a transaction which secured Oswald ordering the rifle. You have to believe that Oswald left his job at Jagger Child Stovall in the morning, even though there's records that say he didn't leave the job at all that day. He then went ahead and purchased a money order, allegedly for this rifle. But he didn't mail the money order from the post office. He walked something like three miles out of his way to deposit it in a mailbox, all right? All right. He then went ahead and walked back to work, and nobody ever missed him. Now, let's pick up the trail of this so-called money order. You have to believe the post office picked it up from the mailbox, drove it back to the mail center, sorted all the mail out, put it on a plane, flew it into Chicago. Then the mail was transferred to the mail center there, that it was all sorted out at the big mail center in Chicago that it was then distributed to the proper mail carrier. He went ahead and drove it to the postal office in that area. It was then sorted out again to the actual guy going ahead and delivering the mail. He dropped it off at Klein's. This is supposed to be the arm center that Oswald ordered the rifle from. They went ahead because they sorted out their mail also by checks, money orders, cash, etc. Klein's went ahead and gave it to their courier. And their courier then went ahead over to the, the bank and deposit it at the bank. Now, if I asked any rational person, how long do you think that transaction took? I think they would probably say four days, maybe. Because if you look the way the post office does it now, it's all by zip code and sensors. They put it on a big conveyor belt, okay, they, and, and the sensor records it, sorts it out, et cetera. This is all done by hand. The Warren Commission wants you to believe that that entire transaction that I just described took 24 hours. I'm sorry, I don't believe it. You can't do that today. 
with, with zip codes and all these other, you know, computer things we have. So how could it possibly happen in 1963? I don't think Gosling was involved in whatever happened in Dealey Plaza. I, in fact, I believe you can make a very good case that Oswald might have been the informant that blew the whistle on the Chicago plot. Arlen Specter, at that time, a DA in Philadelphia, he put together this single bullet theory, sometimes referred to as the magic bullet, in which he says that Oswald firing a shot from the sixth floor of the Texas School Book Depository, this one bullet went through Kennedy, through Conley, ended up lodged in Conley's upper thigh, and then was discovered at Parkland Hospital after it slipped out from his thigh onto a gurney. Did the wounds on JFK's body match the official story in terms of the trajectory of the shots fired from the sixth floor? You have a young Arlen Specter holding a pointer showing the trajectory that the magic bullet would have had to have taken if the magic bullet hypothesis were true. And when you look down below his hand several inches, you see this big patch on the back of the stand-in, which means that a photograph that was intended to illustrate the magic bullet theory actually refutes it. This exhibit, of course, is called CE399. The problem with CE399 is that every step of the way, it falls flat on its face. And I'm not talking about just the trajectory or the fact that it didn't have any blood in it, it didn't have any tissue on it, that none of the Secret Service agents who said they saw it, none of their initials are on it. Many JFK researchers have trouble with the magic bullet theory, particularly um, it's reported with the timing that they believe that uh, there was an initial theory that was developed uh, incorporating all three shots and that this was then changed when it was found out that one of the shots missed the president by a very wide margin. We would expect that when new evidence comes out that the, the story has to change. I don't think Gosling was involved in whatever happened in Dealey Plaza. I, in fact, I believe you can make a very good case that Oswald might have been the informant that blew the whistle on the Chicago plot. Three weeks before, there was a plot to kill Kennedy in Chicago. What's so amazing about the plot in Chicago is that it's very similar to the plot in Dallas. Kennedy was supposed to be in a motorcade, getting off a freeway, getting in front of a, I think, a four-story building, okay? And there were supposed to be assassins waiting right near the building. And they already had picked out the patsy, Thomas Vallee, who had the same profile as Oswald. The informant who started the ball rolling to roll up the Chicago plot, his code name was Lee. So I think you can make a case that Oswald might have heard about this, and he might have been the guy that called in to the FBI, because I, I believe he was an FBI informant, and blew the whistle on the Chicago plot, and therefore that was foiled. But then it did succeed in Dallas. So if you ask me, I don't think Oswald had anything to do with what happened in Dallas. Ask not what your country can do for you. Ask what you can do for your country. There have been two official investigations. The Warren Commission concluded Oswald acted alone. The other, the House Select Committee on Assassinations, concluded that there was a conspiracy. Many of the key documents which could tell the whole story remain classified. John F. Kennedy's brain is still missing from the National Archives. The Secret Service removed and replaced the windshield of Kennedy's limousine so that they could allegedly cover up the fact that it had a bullet hole coming from the grassy knoll in front of the limo. Numerous witnesses were badgered and threatened to keep silent, especially the numerous ones who knew about the shots from the grassy knoll. Over 20 witnesses who would not change their stories supposedly met with mysterious deaths. When the real body of JFK arrived at Bethesda Naval Hospital for autopsy, it came in a gray military coffin zipped in a body bag. Two FBI agents in the room took detailed notes and described the autopsy physician exclaiming that this body had already been dissected. In fact, the top of the head came off on the table and the brain apparently had been removed. The report made by these two agents was suppressed, supposedly, by J. Edgar Hoover. 
all Navy personnel present were threatened with dire consequences if they mentioned anything they saw. Some eventually spoke out about what happened when Congress held the second Kennedy investigation. The autopsy physician at Bethesda admitted to burning his initial report and rewriting one that he had been instructed to write, conforming to the altered body. Photographs of the autopsy were locked up and the Warren Commission only allowed artist sketches to be presented. When the real photo surfaced years later, it was evident the artist had been instructed to alter the appearance of the photos, researchers say. Why the secrecy, if Oswald was just a crazed lone gunman? And now, I'd like to know what you think. You can contact me here at The Conspiracy Show through our website, www.theconspiracyshow.com. In the meantime, don't be afraid.